Hello, I'm Assembly Member Kansen Chu. Thank you very much for joining us in this very important discussion. I also wanted to uh, welcome our county president of Santa Clara County Board of Supervisor, Cindy Chavez, to, uh, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. This is a very, very difficult time. I'm especially honored to be able to serve you with uh, our county leaders, city leaders, the governors, my colleagues, and the legislators, and the uh, congressional representative. Thank you so much for your work to flatten the curve. And thank you who have followed the state and local uh, shelter and place holder, and you are actually uh, saved many, many lives. So thank you very much. Mental health is an issue that has been my priority since I started my public service as a member on the Santa Clara County Mental Health Board. The issue that I have been working on are breaking down barriers to access and helping promote and increase culturally appropriate services. I believe that we must start talking about mental health like our physical health because they are two are very much intertwined, and we cannot, it cannot be separated. I want to share with you some statistics. Um, this, according to the UCLA study, that one in four adults experiencing mental health struggles in the United States, if this is before the COVID-19 time. In March, about 45% of adults reported that COVID-19 affected their mental health. So if you have any feeling about your mental uh, issue, uh, mental health issue, you are not alone. With mental, uh, mental with the children, well, this is really a scary uh, statistic. In the United States, the mental uh, illness in the, uh, with the children, 70% of the youth, they never get uh, the proper help they need. And this number actually shot up to 84% for um, those people that are a, a, a financially disadvantaged family or family uh, that English is not their primary languages. So this issue range from affordability, the stigmas, language barriers, and lack of culturally appropriate services. And that's why I've been a strong advocate for school-based mental health services, early intervention and prevention mental health services are crucial and school are definitely the best place to reach students. So this is, is a, a, a state law because of my bill AB 2022 and 2018, that school, we require the school to notify students and parents at least twice a year on how to access available pupil mental health on campus and in the community. In addition to legislation, I'm working through the budget process to secure funding for mental health services and to improve the telehealth capacity to serve hard to reach population and to continue services during health emergencies like uh, what we're facing uh, today. But today's event is all about you and the stress you face during the COVID-19. I know that it impacted the community a really, really a great deal. Um, people are worried about their own health or their family's health. They worry of uh, the, the food uh, security or insecurity or whether they will have a job, you know, the job insecurity, even the small business uh, um, uh, members are worried about whether 
what the new lo normal will look like, whether they be able to uh, 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 get back to their uh, old uh, business. It's, it's, it's a family with the children are headed really, really hard. You know, they worry about their uh, children, uh, kids' education. They always worry about whether they are uh, a good teacher or they don't want their kids to uh, lay be behind because of the school closure. So I want to make sure that no one has to struggle through this alone. And I want to provide information on resources from local organizations that are standing ready to help. Before we go to the expert who are patiently waiting, thank you. And please join me and welcome the president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisor, Cindy Chavez. Cindy. Thank you. And um, Canson, it is so good to see you. And I, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to get us all to, to focus on this issue as we um, as we move forward. And, I, and I'm really excited to get to the panel. So I just want to make a couple of opening comments. You know, one is that um, the leaders that you have on the, the uh, panelists are just really smart, dedicated, good people that, I'm, that I know are just ready to, to serve you. Um, during the pandemic, I just want you to know that the county and our behavioral staff team are still open for business and supporting our community through call centers and hotlines um, and in person when, when necessary. You're going to see a number of issues on our on the slides, or a number of uh, resources on our slides, and you know, for for any of you who are interested in getting, um, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can also uh, do that. But we have the county has a mental health um, services call center, which is operated 24/7. The call center will make referrals to available community services, and if you or anybody in your family speaks another language. Um, these, they're going to help you free of charge and they have a lot of translation capacity. You can call 1-800-704-0900. Again, I know these, you'll see these numbers at the end of our, our presentations. We also have our suicide and crisis hotline, which operates 24 seven also. And that number is 1-855-278-8422. I'm sorry, 8240-278-4204. I'm sorry, and I'll make sure we put these in the um, chat boxes as well. Um, and also we have a text um, line, which is also free and confidential. And these are staffed by trained counselors. And that number is 741741. We have Uplift uh, Family Services. Their mobile crisis team is a 24-hour intervention for children and teens. And that's also um, seven days a week. You can call toll free um, or you can dial 408 379 The Mental Health Urgent Care Center is for anybody who has urgent psychiatric needs or is in need of medication. And that's open from eight to 10. And like I said, you're gonna get a lot more information. I also just wanted to say, and I really appreciate the leadership of Assembly Member Chu, and I'm going to wrap up here so we stay on time. We have a program that Supervisor Cortezi um, re, re breathed life into, and that's our county school link services. And one of the challenges we're having right now is making sure that we can protect these services during tough budget times. Um, for anybody who's interested in helping us do that, we're Supervisor, I'm sorry, Senator Jim Bell um, is just finishing up a meeting now where he's fighting to make sure that we don't lose $107 million a year from our general fund, a big chunk of that that we spend on mental health services. Why in our county has it become so, so important? Counties across the country use their ex excess property taxes, I'm gonna use that language, uh, to build roads. And in Santa Clara County, because of the leadership of Supervisor Cortezzi, leaders like Assemblymember Canson Chu, leaders like um, uh, former uh, Supervisor, but Senator Jim Bell, we invest in mental health here. And my friends in different parts of the country tell me they use their money to build roads. We build people, we support people. So with that, I want to again just say I'm so excited to hear from our uh, presenters and thank you for letting me join you, Assemblymember Chu. 
Ray, uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. I thank you very much for your leadership during this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. You know, we really make us proud. Uh, Santa Clara County is not just leading, being a, a, a good example in the state of California, but also throughout the nation. So thank you so much for your leadership. And I'll be definitely be happy to support uh, the, the money for this mental health services in the county. I uh, will just write a letter or join the letter with uh, Senator Jim Bell. J uh, Senator Bell has been a great champion uh, for mental health uh, uh, throughout his public services career. So I'd be very honored to uh, uh, work with him and join him uh, with a budget uh, letter. Thank you so much. Now we go back, uh, we're going to our uh, presenters. So they are experts in this area. And I would like uh, first to introduce uh, David Manetta, who is the president and CEO of Momentum for Mental Health. Momentum has been serving Santa Clara County for 24 years, and it is the largest nonprofit provider of mental health services with 12 different officers uh, all over Santa Clara County specialized in different programs. And uh, I think your headquarters is in uh, Ella Rock on the White Road. So that's really uh, uh, my, my neck of the wood. So with that, uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Assemblyman Chu. And um, uh, Supervisor Chavez, thank you both very much. It's uh, it's quite the honor to be on um, uh, on this uh, Facebook live chat today uh, to talk about mental health um, because I've known both of you for so long and I just want to thank you both for all of your efforts uh, uh, to work on the in the areas of mental health and behavioral health at large uh, in our communities. Um, you've both been um, both from you know your city council positions from uh, uh, your uh, board of supervisor position, Supervisor Chavez, and uh, now assembly member uh, Chu. Um, again, the community has benefited so greatly from uh, your vision and particularly on the behavioral health side. Uh, you all, you both were involved in this long before it was popular, so to speak, uh, to be an elected and to be supporting this. So thank you both. Um, well, uh, I just want to say Canson actually gave my presentation, so I don't know somehow uh, all that data and uh, what he said, um, I would say ditto to it, but I just want to um, highlight a few points uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis is that for many, uh, many, many folks in our communities who have uh, behavioral health illnesses, uh, disorders, um, uh, that this, um, this particular uh, crisis um, uh, for many has exacerbated, has, you know, their conditions, has made their conditions more acute. Uh, and, you know, like many of us, they are sheltering in place, um, uh, being good community members and sheltering in place at home. Oftentimes that makes it difficult to then connect to the services that um, they would otherwise be getting or that they would need uh, to help alleviate some of those stresses. Um, so one of the, you know, through these opportunities like tonight, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to get out those numbers that Super, Supervisor Chavez just, um, just uh, you know, relayed to everyone on the, um, present tonight, and I think they have a slide to actually go through those numbers again, uh, and uh, you know we'll do that later. Um, so, just again, some um, some basic issues right now that we're trying to work on is uh, one is uh, connecting folks to necessary resources. Now, the numbers that were given earlier. Um, uh, again, connect people uh, via telephone um, in our community to necessary services. The other area that I want to point out, though, is that if you are, you know, employed, if you have your own health insurance, 
you should also be able to engage uh, uh, counseling and mental health services, substance use disorder services through your health insurance, right? That um, the insurers are supposed to actually provide um, uh, uh, behavioral health services the same way they do for other, other uh, medical conditions, other health conditions, right? It's a parity, it's the parity law. So here in Santa Clara County, we're lucky to have, I think, a very robust public system uh, serving both kids, uh, young adults, as well as uh, adults and older adults throughout the community. Uh, and in addition, people's, again, own health insurance should also be able to ac be accessed to get those services. One thing that makes it, a couple things that uh, Assemblymember Chu talked about earlier that make it difficult for people to get services are the stigma attached uh, that, you know, I, um, uh, if I have, if I'm depressed, I have, um, PTSD, I'm anxious, um, uh, that those symptoms, I, I feel very stigmatized. I don't want to tell anybody. I want to keep it to myself. Oftentimes, there are cultural uh, barriers and linguistic barriers, again, as Assemblyman uh, Chu pointed out, uh, that make it difficult to actually then uh, access the services. Here in Santa Clara County, we have worked very, very hard over decades to make sure that there are appropriate language and capable staff, culturally capable staff throughout our community. And uh, the organizations that are on, not just Momentum, but the organizations that are on tonight are examples of that um, uh, cultural awareness and uh, cultural competency and appropriate services throughout our community. And so again, um, uh, I just want to just just again thank uh, both of our electeds tonight, uh, not just for them doing this tonight, but what they've been doing, uh, you know, years previously and also going forward for behavioral health issues for our community. Uh, they've been fantastic. So um, uh, thank you. And I guess we'll take questions uh, now as well, Kansen. Are we? No. I won't. Let me uh, uh, finish the presentation. And then we'll, we'll uh, take questions. Okay. How's that? Okay. All right, good. Very good. So next, next I would like to introduce Elaine Pan and Irene Zhang with Mental Health Association for Chinese Community, MHACC. MHACC was founded in 2018 in an effort to help underserved Chinese American communities break the stigma on mental health and to provide support and education. And uh, my office has been referring so many cases uh, to this MHACC. So I want to also take this opportunity to publicly uh, thank you. With that, Elaine or Irene. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Assembly Member Gensin and Supervisor Cindy. And thank you, thank you to uh, have the uh, opportunity to, to share some experience. So, Irene, uh, hello, Irene. Yeah, I'm here. here. <laughs> yes, again, thank you, Assemblyman uh, Gensin Chu and Supervisor Cindy Chavez for giving uh, such thoughts into the mental health and behavioral health issues for such a long time and for giving MHECC this opportunity to report what we have been able to accomplish for the Asian American communities, as well as what we're doing right now under the COVID situation. So um, we have two members as Elaine has introduced herself. She's our founder and executive director. I am the vice president for the board of director so I will be presenting for the next few minutes and both Elaine and I would be happy to answer questions during the Q&A after the presentation. My title of the presentation is, as you can see on the uh, shared screen, MHCC, A Beacon of Love. Uh, next slide. Actually, we will play uh, a brief video 
that summarizes our uh, organization. It's created by a talented young lady who has had her own mental health struggles. So as you know, one picture is worth a thousand words and a video will be, you can do the multiplication. Um, if you could please uh, play it. In Chinese culture, the stigma of mental health is very severe, causing major strain to families and communities across the nation. Studies have shown that Asian Americans have the lowest rate of receiving medical treatment for mental illness in the United States. Patients and family members don't know where to get help and fear the consequences of reaching out. In response to this crisis, the Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities, formed in 2012, has been serving the community through providing support groups, workshops, professional courses, and a helpline to all of those in need. All of our services are provided for free and have expanded to California and beyond. We have served over 800 families and organized more than 150 educational courses. Tens of thousands of people have benefited through our various programs and resources. We will not give up any opportunity to save a life and continue to spread mental health awareness to better the Chinese community. Thank you. So I will uh, touch upon a few and elaborate a few things that was already mentioned in the video. Before the stay-at-home orders, we offer monthly on-site support groups for mental health consumers, as well as family members in various languages, English, Mandarin, and Cantonese, which is another Chinese dialect, uh, for Bay Area communities. Now in this special time of the pandemics, our helpline's volume increased by 30%. Uh, what we hear from our communities has been a sense of uncertainty facing this unknown, which leads to higher incidence of anxiety and uh, aggravate other symptoms of mental health uh, struggles too. For example, people tell us they are pacing up and down, worrying that they might be getting disease. Another person expressed the sense of despair and hopelessness. Some said that during the stay-at-home orders, they feel their hearts were pounding, short of breath, and they have a panic attack. A caregiver would tell us that the mental health patient that they are taking care of doesn't want to take the necessary medicine because they don't have to go to work, which in the long run could have detrimental effects. So uh, we have many more people reporting being targeted as Asian Americans in racial slurs, hate crimes, and bigotry. Even before COVID, someone yelled at me while I went hiking, are you a citizen here? And went on to yell more racial slurs to us. Um, therefore, during stay at home orders and social distancing, we understand the even bigger responsibility for community groups like us. Therefore, we're offering more social connections from the online um, support groups, which was in the previous slide. Next slide, which is this one. Um, we also invited psychiatrists who had firsthand experience in helping patients and communities fight COVID-19 at Wuhan, the epicenter of the epidemic, to give online workshops. We explored how to help patients, caretakers, and community members in this unprecedented time globally. We put the videos up on social media, such as YouTube, to benefit more people. We also received multiple media coverage in the traditional media, such as newspapers, TV stations. Next slide. Um, NAMI, which you'll hear more from Kathy uh, in a minute, National Alliance for Mental Illness is a national organization. Uh, they published their magazine called Advocate in their special edition celebrating the 40 year uh, anniversary on the left, our president Elaine Payne was featured centerfold for her effort in fighting against the stigma of mental health and helping scores of people in Chinese communities on the road to recovery. This year, in the special circumstances of COVID-19, we also as an organization participated in Chinese American Food of Love Day, sending meals to hospital workers, the old sick and poor, as well as mental hospital personnel. When Elaine sent meals to one of the mental health care centers, the staff said that they have never received 
any food of love. This was their first time delivered to them be before because mental health caretakers are often the unsung heroes of the medical profession. Uh, next slide. Um, recently, we're embarking on a new venture. We're making two apps for suicide survivors and caretakers, especially for ethnic minorities and immigrant population. These three months of stay at home has taught many of us that physical contact is really not the only way to keep in touch. Social connections via net new technology, such as online media, forum, and apps, is connecting us just like we're doing right now. We're hoping in this new way, apps will reduce the barrier for survivors and caretakers to reach out to find the support they need. There's a Chinese word, wei ji, that describes crisis. Wei for dan danger and ji for opportunity. This pandemic crisis sometimes feels like a burning glass mirror. It manages to focus our attention squarely on the most vulnerable sectors of the society. So I hope more people start to recognize and acknowledge the mental health crisis facing this nation. It should remind leaders at all levels of government as well as communities that more resources are needed for people facing mental health challenges. Despite this crisis, we are part of the big thriving community uh, as described by Congress uh, Assembly member Kenshin Chu, as well as uh, Supervisor Chavez. We will find new and improved way to resume our connection, express a love and concerns for everybody. MHECC hopes to continue our role as a beacon of love, serving as a bridge between consumers and medical uh, professionals, reducing st stigma in the often overlooked immigrant and minority groups, and working with other community leaders to uh, build a better and bring positive change to the society. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Irene. Now you can tell why did I uh, select the MHACC as my uh, uh, annual nonprofit of the year for 2019. So thank you very much. And thank you for uh, introducing uh, uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, I'm so happy that we have both the current uh, executive director and the immediate past executive director with us. So I would like to introduce uh, uh, Kathy Ford and Rumina Nebakar. Uh, Kathy was, was being with uh, NAMI since 1997, taking on various roles and to serve as the executive director from 2013 to April 2020. And in April 2020, we welcome the new executive director, Rovina. So take it down, Bo. Thank you so much, Assembly Member Chu and uh, Supervisor Chavez. Um, my name is Rovina Nimbalkar, and I am the new executive director of uh, NAMI Santa Clara County. NAMI Santa Clara County helps people with lived experience of mental health challenges and families by providing support, education, and advocacy. The shelter-in-place order due to COVID-19 has been very isolating for people living with mental health conditions. And we at NAMI Santa Clara County continue all our programs and education classes via Zoom. Our warm line is active, which is from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m and our after our family support is available on evenings and weekends. And we are regularly updating our COVID support resources on our website, which is www.namisantaclara.org. Um, since May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we recognize that people affected with mental health issues face additional challenges uh, dealing with this crisis, uh, all, as all of us are. Uh, now more than ever, it is very important to remember that there is no health without mental health. Thank you so much. Thank you Happy. so much. Thanks so much for having us. And um, it's so good to see both of you again and all of the rest of the right. panel. Um, yes, you know, it, this is a very important time for, and there's a lot of talk, thank goodness, about mental health on the radio, TV, news. Um, if nothing, good comes out of this, it could be that 
the good thing would be the silver lining that mental health is finally recognized as being as important as your physical health. And you heard others say that on, on the call today. Um, there is so much stigma and discrimination that still exists for people who have mental health challenges and their families. And um, it's time that we start speaking up and showing people. NAMI has been around for, this is our 45th year this year and NAMI National the 40th year. And we're a peer run organization of people who are surviving having serious mental health challenges um, as family members as, and you know, people who live with it. And we do this through support and education. And stigma is fear and, and ignorance. And when somebody is educated, they're not so fearful about something. You know, mental health conditions have been blamed on families for several years, just like autism and developmental challenges were at one time. But we studied the brain in the 90s, and we know now these are not um, blamable illnesses. Yes, trauma, different things can trigger it. And, um, but we need to support and educate people about this. We need to um, you know, strengthen families, basically, and the community. Um, we all need community, and this is the opportunity for us to come together. We see what happens in a, in a crisis like this and how community is helping everyone. And let's change the face of mental illness and mental health in this, in this country. So I believe this is an opportunity to do that. And thank you so much for bringing this to um, Facebook, you know, live. So hopefully a lot of people will see this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kathy, for your long advocate and services in the mental health arena. Um, I wish you a good, happy retirement. I know you're not retired. You're <laughs> still uh, uh, working on many of the mental health issues that are very, very important to us. And I want to thank all the panelists for uh, sharing with us the great service, services and the work that you and your organization offered. And Supervisor and I have been uh, hearing feedback from the our community. So we do have some uh, a question for you. Uh, uh, we'll go get to it in a moment. But to those who are turn, uh, tuning in, if you have questions you would like to ask, please submit your question by emailing me at Assembly member, one word, assemblymember.chu at assembly.ca.gov. If we cannot answer all your question tonight, uh, we definitely will get back with you uh, uh, in a later time. So panelists, we, we will direct questions to each of you, but please feel free to uh, chime in if you have anything to add. And with that, I would like to ask uh, uh, Madam President to ask the first question. Cindy, are you there? I sure am. Thank you so much. So um, let me start by, um, I, and this is a question for NAMI, so um, Kathy and Ravina. Could you tell um, all of our folks that are um, tuning in, what are some of the signs that might have that you might have anxiety or mental health related issues, and how and what can people do to self-assess or recognize it from others that recognize it that might be you know the people that might be struggling? How, what are the great signs? Question. Absolutely, this is a great question. Um, so everyone experiences anxiety uh, disorders differently, and uh, there can be several symptoms that can be seen. Some are mental symptoms, some are physical symptoms. So um, I'll just give some examples. So some of the examples of mental symptoms is racing thoughts, uh, overthinking, difficulty concentrating, um, feeling of dread or panic, feeling irritable. And some physical symptoms can include sweating and heavy and fast breathing, hot flushes and blushing, dry mouth shaking, fast heartbeat, feeling very tired um, wow. and dizziness and fainting. And so I, I think it's very important to watch how we feel both emotionally and physically and then seek help, um, you know, when you feel like this is, this is not okay, that this is, this, we need to, we need to um, ask for help. And oftentimes anxiety can lead to depression. So it's, we shouldn't take this lightly. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, for, for David. Hey, David, how can someone help another person who they are suspecting is experiencing mental health struggles? What, what if they refuse help and uh, pretend they're not struggling? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Kansen. I, I, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, I think this question gets to the heart of why there is such a discrepancy between people who need or who have a uh, symptoms of um, a mental illness or a disorder and getting help. This question actually gets to the exactly to the heart of that, that difficulty. And so as uh, community members, as family members of someone who you have a concern about, who you, you, you worry that they're struggling with a mental health condition um, or a disorder, is one is, is to arm yourself, and, and uh, I think Rovina and Elaine talked about this earlier, is, uh, you know, and Kathy, arm yourself with, it, with information. So whatever the signs and symptoms are of anxiety, of depression, um, uh, know more about it, and then ask them, talk to them, uh, and uh, reach out to them. In these COVID-19 shelter-in-place time, it may be uh, via uh, Zoom or Skype. It could be remotely, um, but it, it's, it's reaching out and, 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 and connecting. Um, you know, the big part of this, this dialogue is about not, uh, not having people um, experience these symptoms and conditions alone and disconnected and isolated, right? So one is that, um, is, to, is to reach out and to ask. Um, and what if they refuse help and they pretend that they are well, they are not struggling? Um, oftentimes, uh, these interventions, you can actually enlist other people in their circles, uh, clergy, it could be other family members, could be friends, uh, and share concerns. And um, again, to reach out and to express that concern and also figure out ways to connect them to other professionals, to um, uh, you know, as we said, MHACC to Momentum to NAMI, uh, there are a lot of call lines. Now there are call lines and uh, in languages, in multiple languages. Um, and, and so it's very, I think it's, it's key to be persistent uh, mm -hmm. as, a, um, as someone who has family members uh, who um, uh, have mental illnesses and uh, substance use disorders. Uh, it's been really, really important for us, right, is to, um, is to get over that fear and to reach out and to ask, um, you know, caring questions uh, as family members and to be educated. Great. Thank you, David. Yeah, you know, the human beings are social animals. We, uh, with the shelter in place, we we'll definitely need to take time and reach out to, to our uh, loved ones and connecting to our loved one. If I may ask another question uh, for El Elaine before I go back to uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Hi, Elaine uh, or Irene, you know, I'm, myself being a Chinese, I know there is a stigma against mental illness in Asian culture. How do we identify the need for support and when is the best time to reach out for help? Irene, I'm back into the order now. Irene. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, my signal. Suddenly, my internet is unstable. Oh, so I'm not sure. Technical um, difficulty. Yeah, we're all so sorry. Yeah, my email is wet. Yeah, could you just answer the question? Yeah, I think I heard part of it, which oh, is. Oh, okay. That... Let, let me repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, please. You know, I, I, my, okay, myself being in Chinese, I know there is a stigma against mental illness in mm -hmm. Asian culture. 
how do we identify the need for support and when is the best time to reach out for help? Yeah, data does show that we do see a higher percent of mental illness untreated in uh, Chinese community or uh, the greater Asian American communities. Uh, this really takes a whole of society approach to remedy the problem. From the government side, I'm so glad that you mentioned your bill, which will put the uh, psychologist into every school so that it became a normalized process to talk about mental health. In, in our experience, so I applaud you for the effort and applaud the California legislature. In our experience, we see that every case is actually different and the type of services they need uh, varies. Um, to truly able to identify the need for support, those of us who want to make a change has to build a rapport with people. So we have uh, positioned ourselves in a unique position to hear cries from help, for help from the community members and so to speak, lend a listening ear. Uh, we want to find out if someone's emotional turmoil is actually interfering with their daily life, such as schooling and work. We also want to assess if the, it's the emotion they're expressing rather than the action that they describe may be the real underlying problem. So uh, I uh, want to agree with David that we not only look at the person as an individual, we also pay as much attention to family members and close friends around them. Oftentimes they are the one who bring our attention to the problem. They can help us also sort through the complex situation to find out what the actual person really need in terms of support. I also want to address what you said, when is the best time to reach out for help? First of all, the individual would need to express their desire to get help. So I'm glad David answered the more difficult question, what if they refuse? Um, James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Um, so the individual's own awareness is the key and that we go back to the advocacy and the uh, education that we've uh, championed uh, in this meeting. Another important criteria is when the family member and the uh, person's relationship actually get better. When the person starts to trust people who care about them and care for them. In other words, a healthy social support network is established, then outside help becomes more effective. Great. Well, thank you very, very, very much. And I'll turn the microphone to Supervisor Pre uh, President Chavez. Thank you. Um, my question is back for momentum. Some sources have stated that stress can be caused by exposure to excessive media coverage of COVID-19. How can we draw the line between being aware of current events versus the, what's excessive media ex coverage and exposure? Good question. David, you got a hard one. Yeah, this is a tough <laughs> one. And, and you know, I appreciated getting these questions in advance and this one I, I particularly identify with, I don't know, you know, Cindy, you and Canson probably the same, same way everybody on the panel is like, you're, you're drawn to get as much information as possible, but the information um, is so, you know, stresses me out. And um, so I think that balance of uh, one being um, self auditing in some ways, right, of knowing when uh, of sort of monitoring yourself and seeing how much information is is sort of too much. When are you on on information overload? Um, you know, we particularly watch this with um, you know our um, we see over just under four thousand community members a year uh, who are suffering from uh, um, you know acute mental uh, health conditions. And, you know, so when we're talking to the staff, one of the things I've been asking or checking on is just to see, you know, what has been the effect of all this, you know, the, the COVID specific stress on, on folks. And, you know, it is related to all this information. It's like all the coverage, uh, you know, we have 24 seven coverage. So being able to sort of self audit, to monitor, to back away from it when, um, people are just feeling overwhelmed. They're, they're tired. They're, uh, again, uh, you know, 
feeling those physical symptoms also, um, uh, really to back away from it. Um, and, uh, you know, luckily we can still go outside, we can still do, you know, exercise, we can go on walks, um, is uh, it, um, really to get out and, and um, you know, uh, take breaks uh, from this information overload. Um, and um, so, you know, I don't, Cindy, I don't know. I, I'm still struggling with this as well myself right now. Um, so I, I feel like I have, to, I have to get off, you know, when I get off the web, you know, or I'm going to go check the news. I have to go check, check the news. Oh my gosh. I have to check. Um, but I, I, I promise that I will, I will back off that and go for a walk instead. So great. Get all off the couch and take a walk. <laughs> okay. Right. We'll do that. I, I have a question for Kathy or Rubina. And the question is, will has to do with the recent rise in teen suicide. What are some things to take notice of and watch out for to prevent these sad incidences? I'll, I'll answer that one. <clears throat> um, it is a very unfortunate statistic that suicide is the second highest cause of death in adolescents and teens. And this has been true before the virus too. And so it's, it's a good topic to bring up because I think a lot of people are not really aware of it. But usually there are warning signs when someone is thinking about suicide. Um, and this is what I think we all have to learn about, just like we have to learn about what is mental health, what are all these different disorders and signs and symptoms. The suicide prevention is a very key thing that we all need to learn. And fortunately, again, our county is very progressive and several years ago, um, they purchased 40,000 licenses of QPR training, which is question, persuade, and refer. And it's an online training. And as far as I know, there are still many, many licenses available. And we, sh at this time, when we are at home and we have a little more time, it is a good time to get that out and, and start learning about, you know, what are these warning signs. So if you see, you know, changes in a person, you know, a child's personality, they were outgoing, they were had friends, and so, you know, then they aren't. That's a very big warning sign. If they're sleeping more, if they're irritable, um, gaining weight or losing weight, um, having trouble concentrating, you know, these are some of the things that we don't really think about. You think, oh, they're just teenagers, they're going through things. But, you know, if it's consistent and it's excessive, then it's, it's beyond the normal teenage kind of behavior. And there are obvious signs that if, if someone's giving away things that they love and fame uh -huh. belongings, that's a very strong clue. But whatever the clues are, we have to learn them and we have to really pay attention to them. And the key thing is, and this is what a lot of people think, well, if you talk about it, then they're gonna think about it, but that's the opposite. Suicidal ideation is very common. It's very normal to have when you have a mental health condition. And we have to understand that is that it is normal and it's very important to talk about it and to bring it out in positive ways and, you know, just have the conversations um, and bring it up in ways um, where you're not going to get no for an answer like, well, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Of course, they're going to say no. Mm -hmm. But if you can be more direct and you can say, you know, I noticed these things and, you know, going on with you and I'm very worried. Um, you know, are you thinking of hurting yourself or, or taking your life? Quite often, they will be relieved to have someone talk to them and say, yes, I feel worthless. Wow. You know, I don't fit in anymore with my friends, whatever their problems are, but to get them to talk about it and then to get them the help that they need. And again, I think, you know, we, are, we consider ourselves at NAMI a community resource center our website has a wealth of information. We have a whole COVID section and our warm line manager has worked countless hours with her team, keeping it updated. And, you know, there's lots and lots of resources. So visit our website. You know, we have trained um, peers on our warm line of 10 to six, Monday through Friday. They have lived experience. They're very open to talking about their lived experience and um, listening, we listen a lot. 
that's a very big thing that we have to learn to do more is listen and then take action and find resources and help help people get treatment just like everybody's been talking about here today great thank you very much now just uh, open up the question with them and uh, I, I'm glad that uh, Anami has a warm uh, line because uh, a lot of time we heard about hotline we never we don't know where do we cross that that temperature right. le a level so thank you thank you so much I can't, yeah, uh, I can't. Before, yes. before you move on, can I just just I just would, would like to underscore that uh, data point that that Kathy um, just uh, shared about suicide being the the second leading um, uh, or cause of death for for young people. Bad. But for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, it's the leading cause of death for twelve to nineteen year olds. Wow. So federal, so this is, uh, you know, um, federal using federal data. And I just want to underscore for, um, you know, many uh, different communities, uh, the, the data will show different, you know, uh, highlight different, different parts. This is one area I want to underscore for the Asian Pacific Islander community that nationally for 12 to 19 year olds, that is the leading cause of death. So it is really incumbent upon our communities um, here to then again, educate ourselves. And the, the hardest question, um, you know, I feel like a, as a parent that you, you know, you could ask is, um, you know, are you, are you um, thinking of hurting yourself? Wow. Uh, and, um, and yet given these, this, you know, these numbers, I think it's imperative that we learn and, and work with, you know, NAMI's got a great course and, and assistance on, on how to, you know, on, on how to do this. We have county resources on suicide prevention uh, as well. Um, so there are the resources out there. We just have to connect people to those resources. I, I want to add one more thing I forgot to mention. So yes. we have, I don't know if people can see this, but this is on our website. It's on the national website. It's called Navigating a Mental Health Crisis, and it's a resource guide. It's like 16 pages, it takes you through all kinds of details and things to learn. So if you want to get something quick and easy to get edu some education, this is a really good piece that NAMI National has, has created. Great. Thank you very much. You got the education, you got the information, but open up and, and talk to, uh, to your, your uh, youth. Thank you so much. Cindy, I know you have another question. I do. Um, I, this is for Irene and Elaine. Being a parent and a teacher while working from home has become really stressful on relationships between parents and children and partners at home. And as a, as a result, some parents are feeling like they're feeling at work, they're feeling at being a parent. Are there any suggestions for reducing the guilt that <laughs> parents feel in this new norm? Um, I think my internet is uh, intelligent. That it knows when I hear a question that will just become unstable. But fortunately, <laughs> this time I hear, I heard your question. And uh, uh, it's really funny you asked the question because I uh, worked at home for eight years uh, when all my children were under 10. So this was before there was Zoom. So fortunately, or unfortunately, my boss couldn't see my face. <laughs> I remember on uh, conference calls and I had to close the study door. My three-year-old couldn't open the door to get my attention. So she would actually slip a piece of paper through with demands <laughs> on it for food or something else. <laughs> so you see, kids are actually quite ingenious in finding ways to express their needs. So that's one thing. Um, joke aside, really, in this new norm, as we say it, we almost have to uh, repeat the cliche, there's nothing permanent except change. Um, and we really have a situation in front of us that no one has the right answer. So as a teacher, as a mother, um, I know it's true that kids have less structured class time to learn academic knowledge. And, but this is more of a temporary solution to a much more serious life and death situation. So um, stay healthy would be the first and foremost concern 
Another cliche is the airplane mask, you know, dropping strategy where analogy where we need to put on our own masks before we can help others. So for this, for now, taking care of our own emotional uh, and uh, physical needs to stay healthy is really what I would tell every parent. Um, so they have to work, uh, they have to, uh, you know, fulfill their working, uh, uh, working uh, engagement. And then uh, what I encourage that is to think about the work format that has changed. Maybe we don't need to be on the phone. We want to be setting realistic uh, expectations for ourselves and coworkers and tell our boss, you know, this time to that time, I can be in the meeting, but I need to make lunch for my children. That's one thing. And the second thing is on the kids side, you know, schooling and learning format is changing based on the new technology. And it may be actually for the better in the long run. Uh, look at the time we were able to cut down. Um, we, we cut down the commute time, we cut down the sending the kids to various activities after school in the scramble. So we may be able to create more learning opportunities together. For me, at least I know, uh, I learned a whole, huge amount of virology in this process of mm. new, new diseases. And children are becoming more interested in science and medicine because of that. Um, they are also uh, great in developing great hygiene habits. So this is a great time also to introduce your work to family. I learned a great deal from uh, semiconductor processing, thanks to eavesdropping on my husband's phone calls. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think everybody will just have to uh, create their own space in their family in order to uh, help each other go through it. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Kathy, you had anything to add? I know, unmute myself. Um, I think Irene had really excellent, excellent advice. And it really is establishing a new norm and structure. You know, we all need structure in our lives and I think routine and so it's just different now. But I believe strongly that this new technology, I like it, if I can learn it, anybody can. <laughs> and, you know, I don't wanna drive an hour to Morgan Hill for an hour meeting anymore. And so I have to Zoom today in some, some degree. I want to see people in person, but you can accomplish as much on a phone call or a Zoom call. And look at the environment. We don't have as much smog. And you can see the Himalaya Mountains. And if anybody doesn't believe in, you know, um, climate change, then they, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> right. Great. Thank you very much. I just to uh, do a quick time check. I know supervisor has to uh, leave at seven o'clock. So uh, feel free that you have another uh, a, a meeting. And um, I really, really want to thank you for joining us and um, help, uh, help me out with this uh, uh, town hall. Thank Santa, you. Thank you to um, you and to this incredible panel. But I, I just am, I'm just so excited um, about the work that you've done and with all these partners and um kathy we will never let you retire <laughs> but um thank you everybody and uh thanks for letting me join you great thank you and, and anurag we'll be able to go, uh, go on for a while or is that a uh, cut off time uh, we can go on until 7 10 it's a number 7 10 so we've got about 10 minutes let me see if i can ask the next question you know this is a t question to david there's some emotional distress warning sign and risk factor that older adult, uh, adult with disability may be experiencing. Older adult. You know, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Kanson, on this one. This, this is, uh, you know, again, another one of the, the sort of subpopulations in the community that I think there's a lot, a lot of concern about are older adults, particularly in this, in this, um, in this COVID crisis. Uh, the worry about uh, adults being isolated, older adults being isolated, being shut in, and not having connection and uh, uh, folks checking on them, is, I think is a great concern, um, uh, you know, generally to, to, to folks but specifically to folks having uh, mental health um, 
conditions or symptoms. So some of the things that I think that, that you know, again, that people should be looking for in their relatives, in their neighbors, um, one checking in, but again, asking them how they are doing, how are you feeling, how, um, uh, and then, you know, also asking how they're just doing on basic sort of basic functioning, right? Um, and, and then kind of work up the ladder on how they're feeling emotionally uh, and, um, and then keep checking in on folks. Sometimes, that on uh, older adults, they are managing many different conditions. So they could have other health conditions as well as mental health uh, issues. And there could even be um, some uh, substance use disorder um, uh, questions as well. Uh, um, uh, one of the concerns that are related, behavioral health concerns related to the, the, these uh, stressful um, crises um, uh, pandemics is uh, uh, use of um, uh, over or over or uh, self medicating uh, their mental health uh, symptoms. So use of alcohol, use of uh, uh, painkillers, use of um, so it's all. I think it's again it's being able to to, to ask folks how they're doing, uh, and 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 asking pretty directly to folks. Great, uh, thank you very much. Due to the time limit, but I have to throw this one out um, for uh, Kathy or Rabina. To, please, uh, can you go over the different numbers to reach out for help? We see various hotline to call and for help, as well as the warn line that you mentioned about. At what point it is an urgent? So. Give us a temperature gauge. Absolutely. Um, so the NAMI Santa Clara County warm line number is 408-453-0400. Um, and then you hit option one. It is uh, open from Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, our oft after hours um, uh, warm line, it's 408-453. 0400 at the same number and then you uh, hit on option number four. Um, the Santa Clara County Suicide and Crisis Hotline is 1-855-278-4222. Uh, and the National Suicide Prevention Helpline is 1-800-273-8255. Uh, then, uh, like Kathy had mentioned, the NAMI Santa Clara County website has a crisis support button on the top right corner, and which has a lot of resources, and all these numbers are listed there as well. And uh, to answer your second question, in case of any emergency, uh, or if you know somebody who, uh, who wants to harm themselves or somebody else, uh, it's always good to call 911. So, yeah. Great. Thank you yeah. very much. Somebody wanted to chime in. I wanted to add that um, the county um, has, again, we live in a phenomenal county, really. You know, all the resources that we have here. They started a mobile crisis team, uh, I think about a little bit more than a year ago. And so that number, um, I don't have it handy, um, but it's on our website. And that is a number you can call if you just think something's going on and you, you're not sure and they, they have, um, can, clinicians on that number, they can de-escalate and, and, you know, kind of assess the situation over the phone if they feel the person is really um, at a point where they probably need hospitalization or some kind of an intervention, they will come out to the home and, um, and they will call the CIT officers, crisis intervention trained officers to assist them if needed. Um, I, I know everybody says call 911, but I'm a little against that because I think sometimes they're not trained in the CIT training, the 40 hours of mental health training. And so it can turn into something worse. You know, sometimes people get arrested or whatever. But um, so I think it's important to find your CIT officers in whatever uh, city you live in. There's many of them that are trained, uh, set up for communication locally. I know Sunnyvale, they have a whole team in Sunnyvale. So, you know, I think city by city, they have different mental health um, 
interventions and then think about the county um, mobile crisis team. And they have also one for teens and adolescents um, through EMQ. It's not EMQ anymore, Uplift Families, right? Um, and so um, those mobile crisis teams can be very helpful if there's not an emergency, you know, if it's kind of something brewing and you want to um, see if they can help with kind of an intervention before it gets to become a, a, a real crisis. Great. Thank you very much. Any other panelists? You want to chime in? I just want to chime in to encourage uh, people who uh, care about other people in terms of having a family member or neighbors that you may think may be of uh, having difficulty. I think the best way is really to reach out to them, to call them, to talk to them, or to FaceTime them. Do not be afraid of uh, what we have in the Asian community. Maybe we think it's uh, you are actually uh, bothering them. I think a lot of those people, like uh, David was mentioning, older folks, they want to be connected, but they are afraid to do so or to say so because they don't want to cause any burden to others like the Asian community often do. Right. They are very, very polite. So I encourage, like me, who's a you know social animal, I would just email my friends just to see how they're doing and we can create Zoom parties uh, and Zoom uh, connections. So to use the technology. Great. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, Kathy mentioned about the CIT training. And I'm just very proud to say that I was serving on the Santa Clara County Mental Health Board where uh, Shannon, Shannon Ross brought this idea to the board and we approved the funding and, and started in the uh, County Sheriff's Department. Now, uh, uh, S Senator Jim Bell actually brought this requirement to the CHP and cadet training. So now I like more and more uh, police peace officers are uh, get this uh, crisis intervention training. So great. Um, you know, just what I know where we really don't have time to uh, answer those questions from the audiences. So we will definitely uh, we try to get back to you and um, we you, and we'll have a screen that you can contact the resources the, uh, or uh, my office. And at this point, I just wanted to, again, thank uh, Cindy Chavez and all the presenters today. I know that these are hard times, but we are in this together. I want to say that again, we're in this together. I'm committed to continue to be a resource and to advocate for our community. If you or anyone you know need help to overcome mental health struggles, please reach out, talk to somebody before things get worse. And uh, call for help and don't never, never suffer alone. So call the hotline on the screen for help and uh, while it, uh, wish you uh, have a great evening tonight. Thank you very much, much for spending the last hour or so with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.